Hello, my name is Holly Dinnany and I am with Family Partners of Morris and Sussex County. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to our weekly Lunch and Learn educational event. Uh, we are virtual and we are here to let you have a virtual lunch with an expert. Uh, family Partners is an organization that serves uh, families who have children with challenges between the ages of three and 21. And it is our uh, pleasure to on every week bring to you speakers who can talk about topics, um, and important information and resources that help families who are caring for those individuals and um, other uh, organizations that are serving them as well um, know what their options are, what's out there and what they need to know and how they can reach people and resources to be helpful. And I'm gonna remind you, this is Lunch and Learn. We're okay if you keep your camera off, if you're nibbling on a sandwich or sipping on some soup, but we do love to see smiling faces. I see Buddy Peterson smiling face coming back at me, so I'm happy for that. Uh, so hello, folks that are with us today, and I will invite you uh, to drop your questions or comments in the chat. I will be keeping an eye on that for our speaker today. And I'm also going to remind you that we are recording today's program. So we will be sending you a link following up so that you'll have this information um, to review or share with a friend or a colleague if you would like to do that. And we are also um, going to send up some follow-up information um, that, that uh, our speaker, uh, Benny Versace, might find to be helpful to you. So we are here for you, and this is your Lunch and Learn. So I will encourage you that if there is a, a topic or a question or a, you know something that you really want to make sure that you get out of today's program, please do, because we're doing this for you. So Benny has been very gracious and uh, prepared um, a presentation that I told her I took a peek at it, and I'm very excited because there's a lot of really interesting topics um, uh, interesting points on raising young adults. And as I said earlier, you know, we serve uh, families who have young adults with challenges, but I said to Benny, I think the presentation she has prepared would help uh, parents serving uh, or raising young adults of, um, of any description because it is a very difficult time, challenging time, joyful time, but challenging time of raising um, young people to be um, the best that they can be and independent uh, uh, young people. So I'm gonna stop talking and introduce to you uh, Benny Versace, who Benny, can you, can you start with telling us a little bit about your background? Because I think it's very interesting that you've worn a couple of different hats and you were telling me before we started recording um, about you kind of um, shifted the focus of your business and kind of uh, you're answering the calling of services that are needed. So welcome to our, our program and, and just tell our viewers a little bit about yourself if you would. My name is Benny Versace. Um, I am the owner of Spectrum Care Management and Counseling. We are um, a social service agency. We actually started out as a geriatric care management agency. And so the name of the business was Spectrum Geriatric Care Management. And I had been working in assisted livings and nursing homes for 20 years. And I paralleled with, um, with the special needs population. So um, I also ran um, uh, respite programs for special needs. I worked in nursing homes in the 80s where in New York, where large um, developmental centers were closing and they had nowhere to put adults with special needs. So they put them in nursing homes and it was really a difficult time, but I really got so much exposure to adults with special needs. One of my first jobs was um, in a group home. So I had that experience behind me. But when they came into nursing homes, it, 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 the, the programming wasn't appropriate for them. So um, I remember the administrator of the nursing home sort of just threw, a, threw the job at me and said, make sure everything's good with them. And so what I did was make sure they were all on one floor, um, not because I wanted to segregate them, but because we wanted to have structured program that met their needs. And for a young person who might be 30 years old to be in a nursing home with 80 year olds, it just that they were able to, you know, be in common areas together, sure. But on their floor, we had we had like a day program in in you know in the nursing home so until i could finally have group homes open up and find appropriate placements for them but that took years um so that's way back in the 80s um but um about 13 years ago or so 
I was still doing geriatric care management and I started getting younger and younger and younger clients. And some of them had special needs. One of them I became guardian for. She was, um, she has traumatic brain injury. I'm still her guardian, love her very much. Um, and I became her guardian when she was 18 years old. She, um, her mother was um, recovering from drug addiction and subsequently passed away. Her father was unknown. When she was 11 years old, she was hit by a, um, a bus getting, off, a New Jersey transit bus getting off of a school bus and, um, and her life changed dramatically. And so once that happened, um, when she, when she was about to turn 18, she needed a guardian and and I was a social worker. I was just a social worker helping. My job was to help find her an appropriate placement. And I never imagined that I would become her guardian. And it's been a wonderful whirlwind um, to, to bring her home for Sunday dinners and, and, and everything. It's wonderful. She's in a group home, not too far from me. Um, she does have significant behaviors. I've been with her through um, some of her teen years. I became a guardian when she was 18, but I, I was introduced to her before 18. Um, and so, so just having that firsthand experience, not as a professional, but even though it is a professional relationship, but I feel like she's part of my family. So I've had that helping her through that journey which has been a difficult journey for her because of her, her special needs, because of the, the traumatic brain injury and her not being able to process information the way maybe a, a neurotypical teen would be able to do. Additionally, I have my own young teen right now. She's 14 going on 15 in a few weeks. And so I know these challenges. So the, the presentation I've set up today is going to help anyone with a teen and really anyone to help get from a more dependent relationship to a more independent relationship. So that's really the goal of today's presentation um, because parenting can be difficult um, for any age um, and there's always challenges at any age, whether you're parenting a, a, a 30 year old adult or whether you're parenting a six year old child. Today, we're gonna talk about some of the the challenges of just being a teen and parenting a teen. Um, that lovely journey of being a teen is wonderful that a lot of us don't want to revisit, but it's important to go over today. So I wanted to just take you on a visual right now of who we are at Spectrum. And that's me right there in front. <laughs> that's our team. Um, we have been providing support coordination since 2013 when the supports program started. But before then, we provided um, case management for different Medicaid waiver programs in addition to the, the geriatric care management. Now, the geriatric care management has taken a back seat. We still do a little bit of it. Um, but, but because the support coordination became so big, we're serving over 1,000 people in the state of New Jersey. So we, you know, it's become so big, we wanna be able to give attention and we just, we just keep growing and we love it. We love it. This team that you see right there in front of you, we just love it so much that um, this, so I get feedback I, um, from some of our staff and um, <laughs> the feedback says that um, Sheila is my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> She's the support coordinator, but some families feel that, she, you know, we're in the family's homes, we're in their lives, we're their partner for, if we're doing our job well, for the rest of their lives. So we've had families since the, the programs first started in 2013, and we absolutely love it. Um, at the end or even during, <laughs> please sign up for our newsletter. We provide so much information. You can go click on the newsletter area and you can see all of our past newsletters and we have tons of information there. But if you sign up, you can just keep, um, keep getting information so that if you don't have a teen um, who's ready to transition yet, you'll, you'll be very comfortable with the adult special needs world because you'll have um, a lot of information. And at any time, even if you're not one of our clients, that's fine. You can certainly ask us questions and we're happy to answer them. We know them 
off the top of our heads, we can recite all this in our sleep. So let me put us down a little bit and we're gonna, <clears throat> now I wanna start with our presentation. Um, parenting tips for guiding and empowering special needs young adults. I don't know if anybody, um, I don't know if you have your um, audio on or if you can just go in the chat. I would love to hear where people are in terms of if you're a parent of a young person with special needs, um, if you're a professional, if you are a parent, how old is your, is your teen? I would love to hear that so I can you know, give you more tidbits according to, to age. But like I said, most of this is in generalities um, and that can be applied to, to any age of a teen and anyone who's dependent moving into uh, you know, more independence. Are you able to see the chat, Benny? Because I see some folks are, or if you're able to see, that's great. If not, I can read them for you, but professional. I know I see, I see there are a few professionals and a few parents that I'm aware of. I see one that says professional, wonderful. I can, I can gear some more toward you, but it's also really information that can help anyone that you're serving um, you know, to, to help the, the parents. So, yes. And I see, I see at least two folks that I know who have older special needs too. Parents in 18, all oh, wonderful age. Um, uh, terrible that it's uh, suicidal and home, homicidal thoughts. And uh, we will touch on some behaviors. Um, we're not going to specifically touch on the suicidal and homicidal because that's, that can, I can talk to you about that for hours. And I'm sure you have professionals that have, but we will talk about behaviors that might lead to certain situations. So we will talk about that and how to help those behaviors. And Benny, I see someone asking if you do presentations for other organizations, and I'm guessing that you would be open to invitations to do so. I will say also, by the way, folks, that you know Benny put this together for us based on um, what we were asking for. So um, again, I applaud uh, her for taking the time to doing that because this is a, a really, really important topic. So um, Benny, I'll, I'll make sure, as I said, we will share Benny's slides following this presentation and her contact information. And I would encourage you to reach out because Benny, I know, was sharing with us before we started recording her passion about educating not only families, but organizations and educational institutions on these important um, timelines and options. Right, Benny? Absolutely. We, we get phone calls unfortunately too often where parents didn't even know any of this existed, any of this help existed. And we want to get the word out that, that we can help you. We, we love helping you. And so I get crying phone calls from parents saying, I had no idea that my son or daughter could have all of these supports and services when they got older. And so, so here, here we are, we're going to start with um, the journey through through the teenage years and then lead you up to um, how to do that, make that transition. So, so the first um, step that I wanna take you through is self-determination. Um, so I, I don't like to read my slides too much, but I'm gonna read this one because this is the premise of, of everything to transition to, um, to a more independent lifestyle. So self-determination is the idea that includes people choosing um, excuse me, people choosing and setting their own goals, being involved in making life decisions, self-advocating and working to reach their goals. Self-determination is when you set things up to get what you want. It is important to understand that self-determination usually contributes to positive results in areas like employment, education, community living, and improved quality of life. So we want to look at um, making our, our teens independent. So independence, especially those teen years, are breaking away from that control. And when they're looking at who's controlling them, they're usually looking at their parents and their teachers and their school, and, and they want to break out of that control. So we want them to do it within the confines of society and, and, um, and do it the right way. And they want to have autonomy any age growing from 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 an early childhood six years old seven years old you're you're trying to to create that autonomy so when someone is not uh, is dependent on you you're not going to tie their shoelaces for the rest of their lives you're going to teach them and teaching them takes longer 
than tying the shoelace, right? You're running out the door, you got to tie that shoelace and you want to run. Well, taking that time to say, I'm going to, I have to wake up 15 minutes early because we're going to make sure that, you know, my child learns how to tie that shoelace and doesn't. So, so all of these steps are going to take more time, but the time invested is definitely worth, worth the outcome of, of that independence. So, you know, it, it, the independence is, is an essential part of an adulthood, right? So um, you probably know adults who are 30, 40 years old who are, are not that independent. I know, I, I know people who are living in their parents' basement and, you know, don't really have, you know, productive jobs and whether that's, whether that's special needs or not, right? So with special needs, you're going to add that layer of that difficulty. How do I let my child go? How do I do that? They have so much they need. How do I make that step? I want to tell you about one of our, um, one of our uh, young women who we, we started, she started when she was 21 with us. And um, I, the, the dad had me go to her home to interview me to see if Spectrum was a company he wanted to work with and he wanted his daughter to, to, to have support coordination with. And I will get into more of the nuances of what support coordination is. It's essentially case management, but in the later slides, we go over all of that. But he had me come to the home and his daughter was working at um, a store, Bed Bath & Beyond, I remember. And, um, and every time the job coach stopped working with her because the job coach said, okay, we're, you know, you're good, you know the job, you're done with these services, they're short-term services, you're done. The job coach would leave, she would get written up and eventually fired from her job. And this happened repetitively. The job coach came back in, they, they got you know, Bed Bath & Beyond to rehire her and it happened finally Bed Bath & Beyond just said, said We're not, we can't take her back anymore. So um, what happened is when we got involved, um, we got her a long-term job coach. And she didn't go back to Bed Bath Beyond, but she did go to another store and she loves her job and she has a long-term job coach now. So that any difficulties, the job coach meets with um, the manager of the store and goes over everything. And little by little, the job coach is giving her more responsibility. So just like I'm going to go over with the families on how to give your children responsibilities, that's what the job coach was doing. And the job coach is still with her to this day but doesn't go as often to the job. So, but we got her, um, she was living at home with her dad getting fired from jobs. And now she lives in her own apartment. We got her a housing voucher with her boyfriend. Um, she's, she's, she's living the life of um, a typical young, young adult and her parents never thought she would ever get to that point. Driving lessons, everything that, that the parent thought would never happen. And so we're, we're so proud of her and, and so many of our, our young adults. So that, that journey from um, you know, dependence to independence is an essential part of, of, um, of the teenage journey. But as teenagers, whether they're typical or neurotypical, the part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex is the last part of the brain that matures. So when you have teens and you're thinking, why are they doing that? You're adding another layer because you're, a parent is not sure, well, is this a special needs thing or is this a teenage thing? And it's really hard to differentiate, but when you know that the, the frontal prefrontal cortex is not developed until about 21, it doesn't matter whether you have a delay or you're neurotypical, it, that doesn't matter. Your brain doesn't matter, puberty doesn't matter. You're still gonna go through puberty whether you've had you know, certain delays or not. So, so this is, the teen years is happening whether someone has special needs or not, it's happening. You can't change that, right? So, so um, that area is responsible for planning, prioritizing, and controlling impulses. 
the things that make you want to pull your hair out when you're when you're trying to help your special needs teen, right? So your those impulses are are very difficult for parents. So we're going to talk about parents um, helping them control, you know, control themselves so that they can help um, control and and not control but um, work on guiding those impulses into um, better behavior. So um, because they're still developing those skills, they may um, engage in risky behavior teens, right? So um, without considering the, the consequences of those behaviors and their decisions. So it's so important as early as possible for parents to help go over scenarios of consequences. Um, I think groups like this are wonderful and support groups are so wonderful for parents to be able to realize that it's not just them and it's not just their teen. This is the teen life. And that, and so we just always want to remember that prefrontal cortex has not finished developing yet. So when teens do some things, you have to say, I really can't blame them. Their brain is not developed. So they're not young adults they're they're not and so it you know a lot of times we like to call our, our you know our teens young adults they're really not they, their brain is not there yet um so we're gonna we're gonna work on that independence throughout our journey today so um achieving independence and self-determination so what teens need is to try new things and for a teen, let's just say with autism, that is a very difficult thing because of the rigidity of, of the, the, you know, the, the diagnosis, the, the nature of, of autism, Repet, repetition is so um, built into to that, that we want to try little by little new things, just like the mom who's running out the door trying to tie her, her son's shoes and has to say, nope, uh, we're going to work on you tying them today. And that might take, um, you know, months and months and months for a, a special needs young adult to, to even be able to master. So where those type of skills may not be mastered, um, you know, at, at the same rate a neurotypical teen may be, a parent can keep teaching new skills within the skill set that they have. And the strides are just so much smaller. And so why, while it may be frustrating for a parent and the parent has to, you know, maybe con, uh, work on mindfulness and being present in the moment and not think and not comparing their child to other, um, you know, other t people their age, because that that's just going to frustrate everyone, right? So learning new skills and testing new abilities is, is true for everyone. If any one of us wants to keep growing and developing, we're going to challenge ourselves. And that's the same for, for our special needs youth that are going through any type of difficulties, that we have to build small challenges into a daily routine. I had one mom say, um, and, and just backing up my background, um, I had previously done um, IIC work, that's intensive in-home counseling um, for, for children. And I really found the special needs um, teenagers to be really rewarding, actually, because when we built a team of um, a behaviorist, you know, in the home, and then the IIC counseling, where I would be counseling the parents on these things. Uh, I, you know, it would be an in-home two-hour session where I would um, speak to the parent for a half hour first, then be with the teen for an hour, and then be together with the, the parent and the teen together to go over some of the things that we learned and some of the things that and I'd give homework every week. And so it's really important that there's work to be done. You know, people call for, you know, IIC services and they're qualified and they have an in-home counselor come because it's intensive and they really need that help. And just um, going to, you know, an off a counselor for, you know, in the office is not going to cut it. But the things I've seen in home, just small little nuances like cutting down on the sugar 
um, it was tremendous, you know, and I, I watched as kids came home from school and went to that cookie jar or that candy jar and loaded up instead of having an apple, you know, and just small things like that. And we're not going to get so much into the physiological parts of, you know, um, of nutrition and everything, but, but that does, you know, play a big role. So we want to look at that diet, but we want to, we want to look at, um, let loosening up those reins and taking on more responsibility. So that responsibility for, let's just say a young person with uh, that, that's uh, in sort of in the middle of the spectrum, right? Um, and they go to the supermarket with their parents. Well, we have 30 year olds who the parents are afraid to leave out of their sight in the supermarket. And so we try little things. I, I tell the parents, small steps, please, small, I repeat that, small steps, small steps, but have them go to the supermarket and say, even if they're not at the level where they can read, or even if they're nonverbal, that doesn't really matter. Um, they can, if they can respond to the cues and you say, okay, we're not going to have sugar cereal, but we are going to get something really good. Let's go to the cereal aisle. And then they walk around the cereal aisle themselves they get a sense of, oh, there's a whole bunch of different cereals. There are choices out there. Before, mom would go through shopping and grab the cereal and put it in the cart and that would be it. No, we're not doing that anymore. The next step is to go to the cereal aisle and just walk around and take the time. So where your food shopping might've been an hour in and out, your food shopping is now gonna be two to three hours, but it's going to be a tremendously wonderful learning experience. Um, as an adult, we have, we get um, uh, supports that help a special needs adults go to the supermarket and do just that. But we always encourage the family to do it together. So as a teen, when you're start, when you're starting this with your family, with your child, you're going to want to start with these small strides, whether it's something, you know, as small as, you know, just the cereal aisle, you know, you can apply that to all different situations. Um, one of the things that the next step would be to, to then make those decisions for themselves. Okay, so the one parameter ma, as mom I'm going to put is we're not going to get cereals high in sugar, right? So we're going to that, that cereal aisle and sorry, uh, person who runs the store, but I'm going to mess up your aisle a little bit and I'm going to take three or four cereals and put them, uh, push the other cereals back and put them in front and say, okay, now from these, these don't have too much sugar. We're going to, you know, we're going to pick one of those. What would you like? And so you're just giving little increments of, of responsibility. Same thing at home where, you know, before you were doing the laundry and you were doing the clothes and you were doing sorting the laundry or, it, you know, Towels are the easiest thing to do, right? So we may say, okay, we're going to start with the towels because you don't really need to sort too much unless you're having a bright red new towel, right? <laughs> but other than that, you're going you're gonna to start with something simple and you're going to move and, and take a lot of steps. That's why for, for youth, and we'll talk about this a, a little later, I love um, uh, that combination of the IIC work with the behavioral, um, the behavioral approach. And we're gonna talk about some uh, approaches that work better than others um, later on. But um, so we're, we're, through this journey, we're going to try to help our teens understand who they are. They're not, we can't look at them, at the parents who are here, we can't look at them as just our children anymore. They are their own person and this is what they are fighting for during their teen years. I, yes, mom, you used to change my diaper, but now I have my own thoughts, my own feelings, and I want to be able to express them. And the hardest thing for a parent to do is to let their child fall, right? So we have 
unfortunately, we have some parents who have a, a lot of difficulty with that. And we've been guiding them even in the adult world, um, you know, letting their child walk in a supermarket by themselves, um, letting them do things on their own. Even if they're in a group home, sometimes the parents, you know, call the group home and say, well, why did you do it this way? Why did you do it this way? And the parents do have to let go. But if the teen lives with them, it's even harder to let it go because you're seeing it in your face. You're seeing their decisions in their in your in your face. But to, to be able to let go within the protected environment of your own home is the best way to do that. Is so you, for the early teens, you're starting off with giving them more and more responsibility to foster a sense of belonging, you know? Oh, mom does this, well, I do this too. We're all a team in this family and we're gonna have different roles and I'm gonna show mom that she folded the towels in a square, but I'm gonna fold them in a triangle or I'm gonna roll them up like Martha Stewart. Whatever way, you know, we, we don't have to be so rigid with our teens to say, this is the way I do it, this is the way you should do it the towels folded. That's a, a big accomplishment right there. So, so you want to apply that to a lot of different, uh, different situations. Um, and new things can be difficult for that special needs, um, special needs young adult, but, uh, or we don't want to call them young adults right now. We want to call them teens because they're not young adults, right? Um, so we want to give them more responsibility right there. That's something new. So, something from, you know, you used to, um, you know, I used to make your lunch to now, now you're going to learn how to make the sandwich. When my daughter was, she's uh, almost 15, I said, and when she was seven years old, I had her making her own lunch. And then when I spoke to the, the school, they were, uh, when she was maybe in fourth or fifth grade, they were telling, okay, now is the time you want to have your child um, remembering their lunch. And I thought, remembering? I had her making it back when she was seven years old. So I didn't realize, you know, that that was something new. And, and she's been making her lunch ever since. So, um, so you really want to go at the pace of your child, but you want to keep pushing them for more and more and some can do bigger strides and some can do little strides but it's those strides even if you have to take once a month and sort of make an agenda for yourself and say okay josh can do this now what are three things he can do to get to another level and those three steps may take 30 steps for josh that you didn't think of and then for the next month, you might think of more, but those just building on adds that um, level of responsibility. So helping to make decisions, um, you, you know, you want to start early by giving choices. So that, that right there from early childhood, you want to be able to give choices. Do you want to wear the pink dress or the blue dress? Do you want, you know, and you give those choices and that communication, the, that verbal, um, you know, don't assume that just because your daughter likes pink means she wants to wear the pink dress tomorrow. You're going to give her that choice, right? So, and as she gets older, she's going to be able to say, I want blue hair now. And you're going to have to have to come to grips with that. Um, and, um, you know, talking out those choices are important, but um, talking also about the pros and cons of those choices. So, okay, your teen wants blue hair, and but your teen is also ready to maybe um, be the leader of something in their school. Will people respond to you differently if you have blue hair? Um, maybe, maybe they will, maybe they won't, you know, that's a conversation that you might want to have. Um, you know, you want to be the president of, of, you know, this in your school, will, will that be different? Is it cooler to have blue hair? And that's why you want to have it. And maybe people will give you more respect because that's in, you know, who knows? So at home, your parents are saying, I really don't, you know, I don't like your blue hair and, and you're getting the eye rolls and, you know, and they're saying, well, you know what, everybody at school loves it because it's cool to have blue hair, right? So, um, but what you also want to do is brainstorm about what things um, you do want to do and don't want to do. Um, and so those little, um, you know, conversations about pros and cons can then lead into brainstorms. Okay, the pros and cons, what if this happened? And what if this happened? 
Now, when you're having these conversations with your teen, your teen is going to buy into one of the acceptable choices instead of you saying, this is the way you have to do it. And so having your teen buy into it and um, in that protected environment, that's your home is wonderful. So you're, you're, you might risk, no, mom, I want to do all the towels together instead of if you put the red towel in there, everything's going to turn red. You might have to say, I'm going to use this as a learning experience and have pink towels for, for a while. And, and you know, that, that is a protected environment. And you're going to say, do the pink towels go with this orange bathroom? No, they don't. So now what are we going to do? <laughs> you know, and so you're just going to have to go over those choices. And I'm, I'm, I'm really making things at a very simple level, but I love it though. Your examples are great. I mean, I think as, as specific as you're being, it is very helpful. I would, I would think other people on the call agree. I see heads nodding, but it's very helpful, Benny. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. But you know, they can apply to, to different and more difficult situations. Um, so these decisions with your child are so important. Obviously, you want to show your child, you know, love and support and how that looks in each family is different. You know, some children, especially, um, you know, children on the spectrum are not that huggy feely. So what does support look like to them? It may look like, um, you know, an, uh, an extra 15 minutes of screen time. And that's a negotiation that, you know, you, you say, okay, you know what? I, you've been wonderful and you haven't had, you know, maybe certain behavior. So it's, uh, we can go into consequences and rewards in a little while, but, but, you know, those are some things that you might want to look at. And we are also especially going to speak about respecting your child's feelings and opinions. Um, just because it's not the way you would do it, you want to have them heard. I remember when I went for my clinical license, my LCSW, one of the things, um, and I thought the test was so easy, um, it was because the same thing was worded in the hundred questions that they give you on the test was validate the person's feelings. So they gave you all these different scenarios, but validating those feelings um, was, was the answer to every question. So your teen may be upset about something. They're not even sure what they're upset about because they're having difficulty processing those emotions. New emotions are emerging and they're saying, I, I know, you know, sort of a vocabulary, a vocabulary of emotions, but I don't know what, what this feeling is. I don't understand it. So they may cry more often, or they may shout more often, or giggle more often, or, or what it is. And you want to make sure that you just validate their feelings and talk to them about it. And so a wonderful thing to do is when your children get home from school, or, or, or even if they have a first job, their first job, how was it? You know what you're going to get at first? Good. Okay. Sure. Yep. Great. Right. That's what that's the, that's the team vocabulary. Right. But when you start engaging them in that conversation, well, what was good about it? Well, well, and maybe they might say something. Maybe they won't. I've been doing it with my daughter. You know, she's a daughter of a psychotherapist. So she, I've, been, <laughs> I've been doing it with her since uh, since uh, she started uh, being out of my presence. Um, and, you know, now she's turning it back on me. Well, what was good about your day, mom? Um, but it's wonderful. It's a nice conversation. So you want to build those conversations. Even if you have a team that's nonverbal, you can get that information from them in different ways. When, when they come home, you can see what's going on with them by their facial expressions. And you can say, looks like you had a good day and they'll smile. And that is wonderful. You want to be able to articulate that. We had a young, a young man who um, was, he just turned 21. He came into the program, the supports program, and he, um, we got him a day program. The mom requested this day program because it was close to her home. Even though she said, well, maybe, you know, she thought she was hoping they would meet his needs. But after a little while, she realized that it wasn't meeting his needs. He was nonverbal. 
he every time the school bus would come, he would clutch his hands and dig his nails into the the chair, the the, the what do you call it, the sides of the chair. Um, so she she had to lift his hands to pull him onto the bus. She said, I took a leave of absence. I said, you didn't have to do that. You just had to tell us we're here for you. But she took a leave of absence and she, she said, I have to find the right thing for him. And we said, that's why we're here. But okay, you took this leave. Um, I said, coincidentally, there was this program I, I see from his um, service plan his, um, in the adult world, an ISP is similar to an IEP. The, um, the individualized education plan is just, now it's the individualized service plan. It's the services and supports we get for, um, for, our, for our individuals that we serve. So the ISP, and it has a component called the PCPT, um, the person-centered planning tool. And in the PCPT is where um, the ISP is where all the services are. And the PCPT is more of the description of the child, uh, of the young, uh, young adult now. Now they're young adults when they're in the adult world because they're, they're starting out at 21, right? So, um, but it's the description. We're going to get to hopes and dreams in a little while. But, but one of the description in this young man's um, PCPT was that he liked animals and specifically horses. So very coincidentally, after the mom calls, um, or right before the mom calls, uh, someone sent an email saying, we just opened Macapin Farm, we just opened up this program for uh, uh, youth and adults with special needs um, to work on the farm. And I said, wait a minute, are you, are you hacking into my computer? This is very bizarre, right? So it turns out, Fast forward, we got him into that program and he did, at the first day, of course, he held on because he didn't know that this was a different place. The second day, it was like a different, the mother called me. She said, I, I hope this continues, but I this is a different child. Uh, um, you told me this is what he needed. Now we're listening. We're listening to who he is, even though he's nonverbal. So he, he gets to go to the program. He looks forward to going now. He gets off the bus. He knows his job. He goes to get the bales of hay. He feeds the horses. He brushes the horses. And in the afternoon, he gets riding lessons. What a beautiful life. He is so happy that this trickled down to other aspects of his life. And this is what we're trying to do um, in little strides, no matter where your teen is. So I just, I mean, we have hundreds of those stories, and, but I just love that one because it was just so kismet, you know, such kismet that the mom called me right after I got this email. So, um, and so that the first thing we did was look at his, his planning tool and say, wait a minute, look at who he is, look at what he wants. This program is not doing that for him. Let's, let's get a different program. So, um, so like I was saying, when you're, when you're um, giving your child um choices and you're doing it together they're making the choices with you it's it's more likely to stick so even though verbally he couldn't tell us i don't like this i want something else non-verbally he was telling us that <coughs> and one difficult thing i think for parents sometimes is to take their own opinions out of the equation so you know, you're, you're having your teen develop their sense of identity and their identity is having their own opinions, whether they vastly differ from yours or not, they, it's good for them to make, to have opinions. It's wonderful. You want to foster that because we're going to get into self-advocacy in a little while. And that is so crucial to self-advocacy to be able to formulate their own opinions. So if they're regurgitating you, uh, your opinions as a parent, that's really not going to help them down the road self-advocate and to have those skills. So we want to try to remember to strengthen those skills, we have to take a, a back seat to ours. Now, your verbal children may ask, well, mom, what do you think about that? And of course, if their mom's a therapist, they say, 
well, what do you think about that? <laughs> but, um, but any parent can, um, you know, can turn it around to say, you know, I have my own thoughts and opinions, but I really want to hear yours. What are your thoughts? And early on in the teens, when you're starting to ask, they're, they're, that shrug of the shoulders, uh, uh, that's, the, that's going to be the answer because we get that all the time, right? No, no, I know what my opinion is. Oh, no. Well, you know what? Why don't you think about it and let me know because I really am interested. And then later on, maybe at dinner, did you think about that? What What do you think about, um, you know, your teacher changing this or that? What What do you think about that? I don't like it. Well, well, why not? Um, she She just does it this way, and I used to, I'm used to doing it this way. Well, what about trying it the other way? And you know, you want to have a conversation. And so this, the, the, your child will go into school with, um, with uh, saying, oh, maybe I should try it a different way, even though yesterday I didn't think I wanted to. And it might not be a day, it might be a month or a week or, you know, or a lot longer, but, um, but it's, it's important to try to keep our own opinions and, and let them start formulating their own opinions. Um, even if they are very different from our opinion, from your, us as a parent, right? So um, just really keeping that communication line open is so important. Um, we're going to talk about working through conflicts uh, constructively. And oh boy, how do we do that? So um, this, is, uh, this is our fun slide where, like I said, we're not going to focus too much on the physical and social changes because that's a given in, 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 uh, in teens and that's a whole other conversation of, of their bodies changing and everything. I just wanted to you know, plant that prefrontal cortex and see you know, so that you know that this is, they're not young adults, but we're really gonna talk about the emotional changes because of their brains developing, um, their emotions are at an all time high, right? So everything is drama. Um, and it just really depends where, uh, where that drama is, you know, so some things um, might be, uh, you know, okay, that was a little drama. Um, like I said, my daughter's 15, I asked her to, to write something on an envelope and it was drama. It was, I said, I want you to write the word August, you know, the month you were born on this envelope and oh, mom, I can't do it. You have to do it. Ah, ah, I'm not a good speller. I said, you're almost 15. If you don't know how to spell August, I'm a little concerned. But it was just drama. It was, it, you know, it's just drama. And I had to take a step back and say, okay, it's just drama. I said, you're going to go on your phone. And if you don't know how to spell August, you're going to look it up. But, but just, you know, by the time we get to grandma's house, her envelope needs to be, <laughs> be written up, you know? So, um, so these are different, different ways. They're, they're going to have drama. Some of the drama is going to be very difficult, you know, um, like we were, we were talking, there, there, were, there is, um, you know, teens that are homicidal, suicidal, and have significant behaviors. And so I can't touch on all of that, but I can touch on some of the basics that can, you know, you can take to guide your teens um, to, to a better, to, you know, to a better place. So, um, you know, the first thing is, is when your teen is emotional, you can't be emotional back. That's just not going to work in any in any confrontational, argumentative uh, situation, right? So someone's being emotional. You're they're yelling. You're yelling. It's just going to be a whole bunch of yelling, you know. So you really want to take the time to listen to what your teen is saying. What is going on? I I don't understand what you're why you're doing this or what what's going on inside of you. I want to understand. I want you know I. If you feel you're not being supported, here I am. I want to support you. I want to know you. You're your own person. You're developing into your own person now. And I want to understand who that's developing into, who you are that's developing into that. So we want to understand that. So we just want to take the time to listen. A lot of times, younger teens are not going to give you their it's privacy is so important to them at this stage um and they're not going to tell you but their actions a lot of times will tell you and then 
from there, just like a nonverbal, you know, uh, young person with special needs, um, your older teen who may be verbal, you're going to be able to pick up on that body language and know that something is going on and that a simple, I'm here for you if you need to talk is so important. So we want to just make sure that you, you let your teens know that you're there to listen if they want to talk and that you keep those channels of communication open, even if it's about something totally not related to what to their emotions. You don't have to keep harping. OK, OK, your emotion. I can see you're sad. You're good. You don't want to do that. Right. So you want to say, oh, my goodness, did you see that show on TV? Uh, the Real Housewives where the lady flipped the table. What do you think was going on there? And, and you know, you can you can kind of divert it there, but you, you might still be talking about emotions, right? So just not their emotions. And then you kind of slide that, you know, parenting, you know, understanding of their emotions. And then little by little, they they should be opening up. But, you know, for nonverbal teens, you want to, uh, you know, assess the and verbalize what they may be feeling, give their, give their voice back to them, right? So, um, and then, you want to have that structured time. So you want to structure um, whether it's throughout the day, whether it's that 15 minutes before, you know, they come home and before you're cooking dinner and your craziness, you sit down and you have a seltzer, <laughs> whatever, whatever, you know, you just sit down with them and you talk. And if they don't want to talk about themselves first, you talk about, like I said, something just benign um and then little by little they will open up and they will give you their opinions about that benign thing they will start talking about how they feel and about that benign thing and once they start talking about how they feel about that then it will open up the door to you know how they talk about um their own feelings um so um uh, we want to understand that anxiety and sensory processing issues are higher than normal during the teen years which is really, oh, and I see we're, we're almost getting closer, closer to time and I have so much to talk about. So I'm going to, um, to, you know, to, to kind of speed up things. I'm sorry. I just looked at the time. I can, any, I, you know, I was looking at the time too, but I, I don't want you to stop talking. So speed up and then maybe we'll see if there's something specific that folks want to ask about. And I, I, I cannot tell you how much, um, I value what you're talking about just based on what we hear from parents and what we hear from um, as far as challenges. I really think the detail that you are taking is very, very helpful. So we actually, I'm going to, I'm going to say this, you may speed up if you like, but I would also say um, we are recording this. So if, if we go a little over and someone has to leave, we will share the video, but I also want to be respectful of your time, Benny, and that if you need to be a hard stop, um, we can be a hard stop, but I just want that, that will be, we are delighted to have you with us. So we'll let you call the shots on the time, but I will also just tell people on the call, this is being recorded and all of Benny's wonderful slides are going to be shared following along with her contact information. So um, Benny, I'm going to let you call the shots, but I, I really, um, this is, this is hitting the mark 110% as to what we were hoping you would talk about. So um so I proceed am, as you would like speed up. So, um, but I wanted to, 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 for you to understand that anxiety and sensory processing. So if your child was, uh, before they became a teen, um, had anxiety and sensory processing issues, my daughter happened to have ADHD and that, that kind of comes together with it. Right. So, um, so all of these things are so important, but this is even heightened more during the teen years. So even with, with children who don't have these issues, this is a lot of what you're going to be seeing, anxiety about certain things, because you're starting, you're trying, you're learning new things that the world is coming at you so fast. Um, so it is hard to process all of that. And again, the prefrontal cortex hasn't been fully developed. But what I like, like I said, the IIC counseling is wonderful uh, combined with behavior therapy. But for those with private insurance also, what works really well for teens, um, especially on the spectrum, um, is DB to the therapies. And if you're looking for uh, a therapist, you want to look for a therapist that does DBT 
and or CBT. I think DBT even works um, a little bit better than, than CBT. And I can certainly go into that, but that would take a whole, a, a while. Um, and I, but I, I have information on uh, DBT and CBT. I just, um, in my notes, I put uh, just some quick general notes so that you could have. And so let me just um, quickly go over. DBT involves both individual therapy and group work, and it helps with emotional regulation skills. Um, and they're actually teaching those emotional regulation skills to be aware of both positive and negative emotions and how to identify them, the ability to name and label emotions, to be self-aware about your own feelings, knowing and using desirable reactions in everyday life. So it's not about how you, you know, act, it's about how you react, you know, um, and the improved ability to manage stress and use positive coping techniques. And so DBT, if, if other um, therapies and things haven't worked, I highly recommend um, DBT for your special needs um, youth, especially ones that have significant behaviors, significant, um, you know, anxieties. Cognitive behavioral therapy is wonderful, and that is sort of like the second one that I would recommend. Um, and but that works very well with children with anxiety. So if anxiety is your key issue, I would re recommend cognitive behavior therapy, where where you're replacing certain um, feelings with, with other feelings. So, and, and you get exposure to different um, stimuli as you're replacing them. And, and so um, I've done cognitive behavioral therapy. I haven't done DBT. I, it's a special training that um, it is required and I highly recommend it. I am looking into um, you know, taking some training because I really find it fascinating and clients that I have that have taken DBT have had very good results from it. So I wanted to, with the emotions, I wanted to give you that piece, um, you know, and not, not rush through that. But um, managing conflict, um, these are pretty self-explanatory, so I won't spend too much time on there, um, you know, to just say that at, when you're managing your teen's conflict, just be cognizant of your own reactions to what they're doing. Um, and house rules, I won't spend a significant amount of time on rules, but it's so important, even though you're giving your child more leeway in their teenage years, just to, to, to have that safety net of the rules and responsibilities of the house is important. So, um, and then when they break the rules, because I'm not saying if, they will break the rules as a team, they will break those rules. Then you want to work with them on all of the other um, coping mechanisms that we've, we've gone over so that um, you're not screaming at them all the time. Okay, you did this. The consequences of your behaviors are this. No yelling and screaming. You just have consequences. You chose to do this. So now you can't do this. So that's the consequence. Okay, so that will be the same in everyday life, right? You go to a job, you didn't do your job. You, you're going to get written up or possibly terminated, right? So um, we want to look at, um, you know, and, and uh, Holly and I were talking about the nurtured heart approach earlier. And the last one on learning the new skills is nurture your teen's nature. We really want to understand what makes them tick and whatever makes them tick. You're not going to, you're not going to do the same for, for both of your children or all of your children. You're going, one child may, you know, maybe, you know, uh, artsy, craftsy kind of one person may be more analytical. You want to nurture who they are and not have the same thing for all of them. There, there are general house rules. Sure. You have to share and respect each other, you know, and, um, you know, tell the truth and things like that. But, but within that, you want to nurture who the child is. Um, the self-advocacy, self-awareness is so important in learning self-advocacy. So when we get a, a client, we oftentimes give the, the questions we're going to ask in our intake to the parents to work with, the, with their children um, together so that they can understand some of the things we're going to ask. Because the most important thing is the thing I get the most blank stares about, which are their hopes and dreams. What are your hopes and dreams for the future? What do you want to accomplish, whether it's the short-term hopes and dreams or the long-term hopes and dreams? We want to develop goals from that, but we want to understand what, what are your hopes and dreams? 
are you a nature person and you want to work with animals or or preservation or um work you like kids and you want to work at a camp that's your goal so new jersey is a work first state so whenever we're we're thinking about someone's hopes and dreams we're looking at relating it to a possible work environment even if a, a parent or an individual you may think, oh, they will never work. It, that doesn't matter. It matters that they are building the skills to reach that goal. So we want to just continue to reach that, those, um, those goals and, and, and work on those hopes and dreams. And every year when we're going over the ISP, we focus on the first, what are your hopes and dreams? We don't even go over the hopes and dreams from last year. We first go over the hopes and dreams now because they can significantly change. And if we go over the hopes and dreams from last year, they'll just recite the same thing, right? So, so we wanna really look at that. And we try as much as possible to get that from the, the young adults, not from the parent. If the, if the, parent, if the young adult is nonverbal, and we, we've talked to the day programs and said, wow, he's, he's gravitating toward this. We're going to say, based on what he's gravitating toward, we want to foster that. And we believe a hope and dream of his is to work with animals because we've seen the joy on his face when he does that, you know? So, so we want to keep um, fostering those hopes and dreams and keep asking. So, the short term and the long term. So from that, then the the your team can learn the skills of self advocacy. And so I've outlined them here. One great place to be able to do that is in their IEP meetings. So they can, you know, a lot of times that they, if they they should understand their diagnosis. So what is that? What is that? You know, just like anyone who has. Uh, you know, asthma, um, you know, they understand that, you know, it causes restricted breathing. Well, what does autism cause in you, you know, as, and so to, to let the team at the IEP know that is wonderful. So we want to uh, self-advocacy at home, self-advocacy during an IEP as they build those skills is, is wonderful to be able to do that. And we want parents to be able to, um, to try their, you know, their com comfort levels with these things. So they're doing it in those protected environments. Um, and um, we're looking at life skills in terms of teaching life skills, you know, assessing the skill, teaching um, new skills in a supportive way and practicing those skills. So um, when, when we're looking at someone, we're looking at, you know, health and safety. Safety is paramount to everything. You know, we don't want to, to loosen the reins at, at the risk of serious injury. Um, but if someone is going to, um, you know, we have a young woman who wears a helmet because she has head banging, but the group home said she doesn't bang her head um, at these certain times. So we want to be able to take off the helmet to give her increased independence. And, and the parents were having a hard time with that. And we had probably, um, you know, a team meetings that lasted nine hours just to say, we're going to try to take the helmet off. And if she does bang her head, you know, we're not going to put her in a place. There's a, you know, something over the wall. We're not going to put her in a place where um, her head, you know, she'll be significantly hurt. She might have a little bump, but that's a learning experience. And we have to go through that. So, so we're, we're trying to teach all of these life skills during these teams, um, team, you know, team years, that um, that life skills is a set of cognitive, personal, and interpersonal strengths that uh, position young people for successful um, lives, and um, you know, as as adults. So that's um, what we're trying to position them and look at all these areas of their life skills. And quickly before we go, we have to let go. Um, so. Compromise is important for uh, parents of, of you know teens. You want to set those limits, but also um, compromise. And if you're working on you know those choices and letting teens make those choices with you, it's not that much of a compromise. Well, okay, if you go to the dance and you come home at ten, you'll be okay. But if you go come home at eleven tomorrow when you want to go to soccer, you're going to be too tired. 
So what do you want to do? You want to skip soccer or do you want to stay later at the dance? And so you're going to work on these. And, and, and of course you paid for soccer. So you want them to go to soccer, but if they do that, that's their judgment. And you're going to, you're going to look at that. So I just outlined things here and um, quickly uh, before we go is uh, all the parents want to know what is there in the uh, adult world and how do you get, how do you qualify for those services in the adult world? This is what we do every day, all day. So your, your special needs youth needs to um, um, be 21 to get into the adult DDD world. There are some people that we've had that are earlier that are sort of grandfathered in, but majority of people at 21 have to have Medicaid, which is easy to get um, when you're applying for SSI. That's the easiest way to get Medicaid. Um, and uh, you have to be a citizen of the United States and a New Jersey resident. And then you have to meet the functional criteria. So the functional criteria um, for a developmental disability, you have to provide documentation that you have a chronic physical and or intellectual disability that began before age 22 and is expected to be lifelong and limits your ability to care for yourself and live on your own. Um, and in, in different areas, self-care, receptive and expressive language, learning, mobility, self-direction, and capacity for independent living, living and economic self-sufficiency. So um, they, there is a, a tool that they used um, called uh, the NJCAT, the New Jersey Comprehensive Assessment Tool, where the DDD, when you're applying, um, they ask you, um, it's about 100 questions. Um, uh, dressing, bathing, grooming, um, are they, uh, can they do it independently? Do they need assistance? Um, how much assistance? Do they need handheld? Do they need physical guidance? And so they're asking you all of these questions every, and, and all of those areas. And then once um, you meet those, that criteria, um, adults, uh, the, the eligibility in the support where there are two different programs in the adult world, the supports program and the community care program. The supports program, it, they actually, for, in my mind, they se se seem like they should be, the name should be reversed because the community care program typically is for people who are in a group home, which, and the supports program are for people who are living in the community out in their own homes or with their parents, right? So those are the two programs. Um, and this is the criteria for those two programs. So you'll get the slides for that. And then within those programs, these are the services that are in the programs and they're a host of wonderful services. So just to, to quickly go over that, assistive technology needs they have, behavioral supports, um, under 21, you know, you'll get a BCBA and things in, um, and, uh, be, you know, over 21, they just call it behavior support. So it's the same service, it's just, it's just a different um, term. Um, they have career planning, which, doesn't mean that your uh, youth doesn't have to be ready for a job. It's a wonderful service that's not used that much. And there aren't that many providers. And hopefully that we're going to be getting more and more. But career planning is just helping. It's sort of like psychotherapy for careers. Well, what's out there? You know, especially as special needs, you might have limited exposure to that. And now let's just talk about what's out there. We're going to show you videos. We're going to show you different scenarios of different types of jobs. Wonderful service, I love it. Um, cognitive um, rehabilitation in the supports program. Um, uh, Community-based supports is like an, a, a, a support person to take you out into the community, whether you're going food shopping or thing, to teach your special needs young adults um, how to, like we were saying before, how to pick, make special you know, choices. We have a young girl um, who she gets community-based supports. I, we have a majority of our clients get community-based supports, but a young um, woman, she, um, she wants to learn, uh, she's gaining weight. She wants to learn um, better eating habits. She wants to learn how to cook. She wants to learn how to go food shopping for herself and know what food to pick. And she wants to learn how to make change and, and, and do better with money management. 
she actually works at a food uh, a stop and shop. So she, um, so this is, it's wonderful because her community-based support person meets her after work and then goes over all of these skills in the supermarket, then drives her home and then goes, unpacks the food and helps her cook and, and not, not, cooks for her, makes a recipe, guide, guides her with the pots and pans she needs and everything. So there, that's a person who's teaching her one-to-one -one skills, whether it's in the community or at home. It's called community-based supports and it's a wonderful service. Um, community inclusion is the same service used in a group. So when we have, um, you know, if you say, oh, Josh would love if he, if he can have more opportunities to make friends doing something that he likes, he loves bowling. Well, hey, you know what? We're serving a thousand people. Well, maybe some of our other clients, you know, I talk to the staff, do you have anybody that else that likes bowling? And we call a provider and say, we have these four people who want to go bowling every Friday night. And that's community inclusion. They do it together um, and they make friends and they do something that they like. Um, and so the, one, the most wonderful thing about these programs is you really, there are all of these services, but one of the services that I really, um, let me see the goods and services, they have goods and services. So goods and services allows uh, your special needs young adults to tap into anything you or I would tap into. You want to take a yoga class? It doesn't have to be a yoga class for special needs. It can just be a yoga class. And if you need support in the yoga class, we can have your community-based support person go with you. Um, so you can tap into anything. It also pays for college classes, um, uh, any type of other classes. Um, we have a young man who wanted to take this nine-month course um, through um, the Department of Corrections, like a, it was, it's like a, um, it's for youth with special needs, but it's, um, it's sort of like just working at, with the cops, basically, you know, like working at a police station, and he loved it, uh, but he also took a three-year class at Monmouth University, um, and they had a special class for adults with special needs, uh, increasing their reading and writing and math skills. So that was wonderful. But we also have people that are taking regular college credits and their budget through the supports program, everyone gets a self-directed budget. So when they do that, that uh, NJ cat, that's a hundred questions, the DDD then takes that, they have a formula and they make a tier and out of that tier, they are assigned a budget. So someone with um, high functional abilities might get $20,000 a year. Someone with lower functioning, maybe they're in a wheelchair, they're nonverbal, they don't make eye contact, they, um, you know, they, they really need a lot of personal care needs, um, they may get $65,000 a year. Then someone, people who are in the CCP, the community care program, have an additional budget to pay for residential services or 24 hour services at home. So a large amount of the people who are in the CCP program, like I was saying before, um, the community care program, they have to meet um, the functional criteria for, um, it's called ICF, um, um, the, the level of care, the intermediate care facilities level of care. Sort of like if you would need, um, you know, a nursing home or if the behaviors got to be too much at home um, and, and they needed a nurse, you know, a, a group home. Now, group homes are not what a lot of people think. Group homes, my, my young woman that I'm, guardi that I'm guardian for, she is in a group home with two people. So it's, it's a condo. It's a really cute condo, two bedroom condo. They had part of the living room that has a desk for the staff, um, the, her own washer dryer in the condo and she's doing things, you know, she's doing her laundry with the guidance of the staff and everything. So that's as close to her own apartment as she's gonna get. And it's wonderful. She went from a group home that did have about six or eight people, I forget how many people were there. And there, it was too much stimuli for her. So to have this two bedroom, cute little condo, um, it is a wonderful life for her. And, and you know, I, I just hope she keeps continuing to grow. And I'm gonna wrap it up. If you have any questions, um, you know, I'd be happy to answer. 
feel free to just give me a call if you want. Um, I know, Betty, we had some folks who were interested in your services and costs and that kind of thing. And is the best thing for them to do to reach out to you separately or to reach out to your company in general? Or what would you recommend? You can reach out to me. Um, but let me just tell you, all of these, uh, well, the, the services after once you're 21 are completely free because they're covered by Medicaid. So we are Medicaid providers and we bill for our services directly to Medicaid. It doesn't come out of your, your, your budget that the DDD gives you. So it's completely free. We, are, we get the people to help you. So we get the people to do all this and then we oversee it all. For some people who are age 18 to, to under 21, um, families hire us um, and I can, we can go over a service contract and everything if you want to learn that. But families hire us to bridge that gap, to help get them services, um, maybe while they're 18 to 21, there aren't that many, but we do go through performed care and we help them enroll in Medicaid. We get them, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of paperwork and some families are just overwhelmed. And I do have this wonderful um, a newsletter that we sent out to transition coordinators. It's not on our website. Um, I, I can put it, I can email that to you if you um, have my email. I'm sorry, I should have put it on here. Is um, you can just send it to info at spectrumcmc.com. Um, my name is Benny Versace, so it's B Versace at spectrumcmc is my email, but you can send it to the info email. It comes directly to me. It's a lot easier. And from there, you can ask me any questions. You can ask me for that newsletter that goes over every step of the way, you know, to to getting into the DVD services. So I can certainly, you know, give that to you, um, and that would be a really good um, resource for you. That's great. And last question, Betty, is if somebody was interested in how they would find DVT therapy, or you could you help them direct that way, or what would you recommend they do if I they're would looking recommend into? They reach out to their insurance company. Okay. So in their area, you know, they, they would get a list of D, DBT therapists. Um, they can certainly email me to see if I've heard of any. So, um, but um, they, the, the first step would be to reach out to their insurance company. That's wonderful. I, Benny, we can't thank you enough for, let me tell you, talking about dropping some major knowledge, but the wonderful thing is it was packaged with such care and compassion and hope. Um, it really um, was a wonderful presentation that I look forward to sharing with uh, not only the folks that were on this call, but our families in general and the community up on our YouTube channel. And thank you for putting this together for us. I really, um, it's a joy to see somebody who takes so much uh, care and gets so much gratification out of what they do. And I think I, we witnessed that for the yes. past uh, hour. So thank you so much. No problem. It was a joy. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks. Take care, everybody. Bye. Talk to you soon.